Man, uh, it's an honor to get to be here. Thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, to, to tell you the truth, I've been traveling and preaching all over the country for about 10 years now, and this is my first time preaching in Mississippi. Yeah. So, so I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm honored. I got, and I got, I got all this introduction stuff I want to do. I want to tell you all about me and all this stuff, but I got to time out for just a minute, and I, I really want to just set this evening real quick and ask you a question. How many of you came expecting God to show up and do something in your life tonight? Okay, that's that pretty good. That's most of you, right? You, got, you even got a little loud. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that level of expectation. I want you to raise it by 100. Because I'm going to tell you some truth tonight. God is about to show up in a mighty way in this place. I don't know what you needed when you walked in, but you won't when you walk out. And let, let me tell you why. Because, again, for 10 years I've been doing this, traveling all over the country, preaching messages. I love doing it. It's my favorite thing in the world. And I've only been sick while I'm doing this one time in my life. One. Until today. It's going to make two. For the last six hours, I've been extremely sick to my stomach. Couldn't get out of my bed at the Airbnb. I feel awful. Uh, I got here. I told them, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. And then I started thinking, man, I don't feel so good. So what I'll do is I'll change my message. I'll write something shorter. Uh, that way I can get through it faster and we can get out of here and I can get back to bed. And then everyone started praying over me. And then God started whispering in my ear. He said, you're not going to change your message. He said, because I told you what to preach. He said, they need what you're going to preach tonight. He said, you see, the devil knows that too. So he took his shot to shut me down, to change my message. He, he got so close. He got so, I was ready, man. I was ready to throw it in tonight. I just didn't think I was going to make it. Matter of fact, I had him put a trash can over there. So if I need to throw up, I'm just going to do it. And then just hop right back up here. And if any of you puts it on YouTube, I know how to find you. <laughs> this is a small town, okay? I'm kidding. I, but seriously, I just want you to raise your expectation because I did. I had to. If God, if, if God wants to do this this bad, that the devil wants to shut it down this bad, I can't wait to see what he's going to do. Look, I love that Palmer said that, that, he, that, that I changed his life. The truth is I didn't change his life. I can't change anything for anybody. Jesus did. I love that they said that, that I'm the man, the myth, and the legend, but I'm not. I'm just like every one of you. If we're going to make anybody famous, it's going to be Jesus. That's the only name I want to make famous. The truth is my presence here does nothing for you. His presence here changes everything for you. Amen. So while I am very honored, thank you for all the kind words. And, and, and thank you that for those of you that have been blessed by my ministry and you've told me that. Thank you. But understand it. Whether I'm here or not, God can show up in a mighty way tonight. Whether I'm preaching or that little guy's preaching, it doesn't matter. Amen. So with all that being uh, said, who came expecting God to show up tonight? See, that was the response I was looking for the first time. If you would have done that, maybe I didn't even have to get sick. So now I'm blaming y'all. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So, all right. Now let's get back on track. Hi, I'm Kelly Kay. How are you? Uh, for those of you, how many of you have no idea who I am? You've never seen me? No, nothing. So many hands. That's awesome. Um, for those of you raising your hands, this is your first time seeing me. Let's just address the elephant in the room. Some of you right now are saying, that guy. That's not a preacher. <laughs> that guy looks like he might rob me in the parking lot. If you're thinking that to you, I want to say this. I might. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I won't. But here's the good news. If God can do this with me, what's your excuse? Ah, ah. No, so my name is Kelly. I'm a full-time traveling evangelist, for those of you who don't know. I'm the associate pastor of Limitless 405 Church in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. For the last 10 years, I've traveled the world telling everybody about Jesus because there's literally nothing else I want to talk about. Amen. Uh, I write books as well. Uh, I have three books out. I have a book called Reckless Love Revolution. I have a book called Get Lit, Stay Lit, Spread It. And then I have this, uh, my last book, The 40-Day Devotion, or that Palm was talking about called Think About That for a Minute. And uh, how many of you follow me on social media? How many of you? Oh, so many in this room. It's amazing. I have to thank you guys. 
because of you guys, and it's just you, because I haven't advertised this book, I haven't talked about it anywhere else except for TikTok, because of you guys, this was the number one Christian book on Amazon for six months in a row. Yeah. And I am so grateful for that. Thank you. I had no idea when God told me to write this, it was going to do all that, and it's still going, and it's, it's been amazing. But I have to thank you, because it's because of you sharing the videos, commenting on the videos, buying the book, that that was even able to happen. So we're doing ministry together, if you didn't know that. If I made videos and you never watched it, what good was that video? If I made it and you didn't share it, what good was it? We're a team. We're doing this together. So I have to thank you as well. So if you don't have this, I've got them out there available for sale. This one is free, though. It's totally free. It's right here, and it's free. I get it. I've been sick. I wouldn't want to touch it either, but it's free. Um, that's how that works. Amen. I stood at a church for 22 minutes one time trying to give a book away. Okay. I'm kidding. Oh, I forgot to start my timer. This was all bonus. You're welcome. All right, so I'm, I'm ready to jump in. Um, I forgot to tell you, I have a beautiful wife named Lindsay. Uh, I have five kids, Brennan, Chase, Avery, Jackson, Jet. <laughs> and I know you're looking at me going, dude, you're 22. You don't have five kids. Thank you. Uh, I have a 23-year-old down to a two-year-old. You know what that means? I'm tired. <laughs> Pray for me. No, the good news is all my kids love Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, Jed is two. She claims to love Jesus. We see no fruit of Christ in her life yet. <laughs> but eventually it'll catch up, right? <laughs> but I always like to tell you about my family because if you see me, that means they don't. And uh, I appreciate when you pray for me in my ministry, but please keep my family in, in prayer as well. It's, it's difficult doing this, being on the road and away from them, but God has given a grace to our family for the season, so we're able to do it. But uh, I just always want to mention them because we're doing ministry together as well. It's not just me. It's all seven of us. Amen. So thank you for keeping my family in prayer as well. Who's ready to jump into the word? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. All right. I do this everywhere I go, and I, I can already tell I don't have to here, but we're going to do it anyway. As loud as you can, let me hear you say, preach it. Preach it. Say, come on. No. Say, that's good. that's good. Say, amen. amen. Say, I will not repeat everything I'm told. <laughs> Man, y'all almost made it. Now, listen, listen, listen. At any point tonight, you want to, if the Holy Spirit starts stirring something up in you, and you like what you're hearing and you want to say preach it, you can. You want to shout amen, you can. I don't know who started the rumor and started telling the lie that church is supposed to be quiet and boring. It is totally a lie. Someone lied to you. Church should hands down be the most exciting, most fun place you've ever been in your life. Come on. I see you people at football games. Y'all go crazy. It's two degrees. You ain't got no shirt on. What are you doing? screaming, going out your mind, come to church. That's on Sunday too. What? What? Listen, when you go to that football game, man, you're just there to watch some dudes just like you play a game. But when you come here, you're having an encounter with the creator of the universe who can change everything. We should have more fun and be more excited about being here than anywhere else. So if you start getting stirred up and you say, preach it, guess what? That might stir up him. And then he's going to get excited and say, preach it. That's going to stir me up. And the more I'm stirred up, the more she's going to get stirred up. And pretty soon we're going to have a Holy Ghost party. And church is going to be the best place we've ever been. Amen. Preach it. I will. Father, we come to you right now. I thank you so much for another opportunity to spend time in your presence. God, I thank you. My presence does nothing for anyone, but your presence changes everything. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Have your way tonight. I just speak to you, devil, and say, you get out of this place. You can't have me. You can't have my body. You can't have one mind in this room. We come against you right now and say your assignment is canceled. Get out of here. Father, I thank you for the freedom that's coming tonight. Father, I thank you for the healing that's coming tonight. I thank you for the deliverance that's coming tonight. I thank you for the repentance and the freedom that we will walk in tonight. Father, I thank you that right now you're opening up every heart, every mind, and every ear to receive a fresh revelation of who you are. And that we will leave different because we had an encounter with you. Father, I thank you that I don't have anything amazing to say. But you do. And I thank you for using me anyway. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said. Yeah. Hey, man, that was a good amen. You, you must be practicing at home. 
That's what I like to hear. All right. Let me ask you a question. I always like to start off with a question. Especially if you watch my videos, you know I start off with questions all the time. Here's my question for you. Have you ever thought you knew the right word only to find out you did not know the right word? Isn't that embarrassing? It's totally embarrassing. It's, it's, it's happened to me more times than I could tell you. Probably the funniest time that it ever happened to me, though, was uh, back in the day. I was a, a fan of this Christian rock band called Blindside. They're from Sweden. And they came over to the to U.S. to do a, a tour, and I wanted to go see them. So I go see them, and they start playing my favorite song. Now, in this song, I believe 100%. Everything in me believes the lyrics to this song are, I'm a vampire, I'm a vampire. <laughs> I am at the concert, jumping up and down, screaming as loud as I can to my favorite song, I'm a vampire, I'm a vampire. People are looking at me really weird. I didn't understand why. Only to go home and read the lyrics of that song. To find out that it does not say I'm a vampire, no. Instead it says, I'm no teddy bear, I'm no teddy bear. And all I can think to this day is those people that were standing next to me. That probably also still tell this story. In a much different fashion. Do you remember when we went to that concert and we stood next to that vampire? <laughs> he was happy about it too, you know? I, can't, I guarantee, I was embarrassing. But what, what's worse though, what's worse than using the wrong word is when you use the right word, but you use it the wrong way. That's even worse, right? I mean, when you use the wrong definition for a word, oh, oh man, you look like an idiot, you know? But the truth is, there's words that we do that with every single day that we don't even know. The, the one that drives me the craziest, though, that I cannot stand when people use this word wrong. Are you ready? Literally. <laughs> Look, I'm an author. I write books, okay? When you use literally wrong, you literally couldn't use it any more wrong than you are. Like, what? they think it means actually. It doesn't mean actually. It, it means figuratively. It means literally. Right. It, it, I'm sorry. Reverse that. Scratch that. It does mean actually. It doesn't mean figuratively, right? So I had a friend, no joke, call me one time. Kelly, oh my gosh, bro. I went to this movie last night. It's hilarious. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. He's like, you got to see it. It was so funny. I literally peed my pants. <laughs> I was like, ooh, that's gross. <laughs> He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what'd you do? He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, what'd you do with your pee pants in the theater? He's like, no, bro, I didn't actually pee in them. I literally peed in them. <laughs> That's what that means! Oh, it drives me crazy, right? All right, look, here's another one. Here's another one. I bet you didn't know that you used this one wrong. Are you ready? Ultimate. What does ultimate mean? Anybody? What, the best? I heard the best. What else? Amazing, the most. Anybody else? What? The top. Oh, somebody, you t English teacher, aren't you? Huh? I, was, I knew it. <laughs> Nobody gets that. Here's what, here's what ultimate. Look, we think that ultimate means the best, the most amazing. What does ultimate actually mean? It means the last item on a list or the top. Absolutely. We're close. The last item on a list. Look, let me show you. If you want to use ultimate correctly, it would be like this. Uh, I have to go to the store and get some bread, um, some milk, and ultimately eggs. You're welcome. <laughs> you learned something today, right? All right, look, here's another one. Here's another one, ready? Conversate. What does conversate mean, anybody? To talk? What else? Have a conversation? You know what conversate really means? Nothing! It's not a word! It doesn't even exist! Stop saying that! There's conversation. There's converse. There's no conversate. You kidding me, man? Where did that come from? Converse. Y'all crazy. Y'all tripping. <laughs> one more. One more. You're like, is this guy ever going to teach about Jesus? What is he doing? I'm getting there, man. Track with me, all right? Last one. This one's important. This one, this is, this is the jumping off point, okay? Pay attention. Decimate. What does decimate mean? Well, obliterate, right? Okay, the very first time I preached this message, I said, what does decimate mean? And a lady in the front row looked at me and went. 
and you just did the exact same thing. Deja vu. That was awesome. Destroy. See, all right, that's it. We like to think that decimate means to completely destroy, obliterate, annihilate. Do you know what decimate really means? It means to destroy one-tenth of something. Look at the name. Desa, deca, may. Ah, but here's what I want you to see. Watch this, watch this. If you go to the dictionary right now and open it up and search the word decimate, what you will see is it will say to completely destroy. But then if you read down a little further, you know how there's like one definition and then another? It will say historically means to demolish one-tenth of. Do you see what's happened? We as a culture have used the word wrong for so long and so many years that instead of us fixing our perception of what the word actually means, we just went and changed the meaning of the word itself. And that can be extremely dangerous. I think it can be very dangerous when it comes to words in this book right here. And I think there is a word in this book that we have done exactly that to. Now, we have completely changed the meaning of this word, and we no longer know what it means. And because we don't know what it means, we don't fully understand it. And because we don't fully understand it, we're afraid of it, and people won't teach on it. And we don't see freedom in our lives like we should. So I'm going to preach about this one word, if that's okay with you. Do you want to know what it is? Repent. Repent. And look, I already know how you feel about that word. Because as soon as I said it, all the life sucked out of this room like a vacuum. <laughs> repent. Oh, great. <laughs> Preaching on repentance. Oh, I knew we shouldn't. We shouldn't have came. Look, all those tattoos. He's evil anyway. <laughs> now I'm going to feel awful about myself for the next 45 minutes. And this guy looks like he might preach long, too. Look, man, that's how I felt my whole life. I remember going to church. For a revival, and the pastor said he's preaching on repentance. I'm like, buckle up. Here we go. I'm going to hate myself tonight, right? Why? What, what have we been trained and conditioned to think that repent means? I'll tell you. You should be ashamed of yourself. You should feel awful for what you've done. You did what? You need to repent. You should be ashamed of yourself. That's how I was taught repentance. Did you? My whole life growing up. If I was going to hear about repentance... I knew I'm going to feel awful because that meant I should feel really bad about the things I've done in my life. Hmm. Here's the thing, though. Jesus' very first sermon he ever preached, the very first word of his very first sermon, do you know what it was? Let me show you. In Matthew 4, 17, you see Jesus just coming out of the wilderness. He's been tested for 40 days. He comes out to start his public ministry. It says, from then on, Jesus began to preach. Ready? Here's his first sermon. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Okay? So what you're telling me is that Jesus' his very first sermon, that he ever preached. You know, Jesus, our God of love, mercy, grace. The very first thing he ever says is, you should be ashamed of yourself. You people, you should feel awful. But turn to me, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, no thanks. I'm going to pass on that. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. If you open up your dictionary right now and look up the word repent, do you know what it says? It says to feel or express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. Feel sorry for, regret, Rue, reproach oneself, be ashamed of. See, we've used that word wrong for so long that we have now completely changed the meaning of that word. But do you know what the, the Greek word for repent is? Because you know the Bible wasn't written in English, right? Like, you know that. The Greek. <laughs> if you didn't, I'm sorry. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> The Greek word for repent is metanoia. And do you know what metanoia means? It means it's a transformative change of heart. Metanoia means a change of mind that leads to a change in your direction. Ah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. A change of mind that leads to a change of direction. 
You see, when we teach repentance as you should be ashamed of yourself, you should feel awful. You, you drank what last night? Phew, need to repent. Be ashamed. You, you, you guys are living together. You're not married yet. Oh, you need to repent. You should feel awful for that. The problem I have with that is that my Bible in Romans 2, 4 tells me for it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Did you hear what I said? I said it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance, not the shamefulness of you. It's the goodness of God. This teaching of you should be ashamed, you need to feel horrible. I don't know where that came from. It came straight from the pits of hell because my Bible teaches me. It's because of how good God is that changes my mind and changes my direction. Let me tell you something very important tonight, and I hope this sticks with you forever. Repentance is not when you cry. It's when you change. Yeah, you'll cry when you feel bad, for sure. You'll get emotional when you feel bad for the things you've done. But the shamefulness of you can't sustain you. See, let's look at Jesus' first sermon through the right lens. His first sermon, Jesus said, hey, guys, I want you to change your mind about some things. I want you to change your direction. For the kingdom of heaven is near. Oh, that, that sounds a lot better to me, doesn't it to you? Because that's what he meant. That's what he was saying. Look, I like to call this the repentance loop, all right? Now, you have never done this, clearly. But maybe you know somebody that's done this, all right? Have you ever seen somebody get in what I call the repentance loop? It's where you're living their life, and yeah, you got sin in your life, no big deal, whatever. You're just living, cruising along with your sin. You come to church, you hear an amazing sermon from an amazing evangelist, hey. <laughs> you start to hear God and feel God speaking to your life, and you feel bad about the things that you've done. So because you feel bad, you want to make a change. So you've gone this direction, but now at church, I hear this message, man, that message Kelly preached, that was just for me. I needed it. I feel so bad about what I did. I'm going to start changing my direction. Here's what happens. They change their direction, but pretty soon you forget about how bad you feel, don't you? That shame and that guilt that wears off, it's not sustainable. And what happens? You forget about how bad you felt. And before you know it, you've turned completely around. You're right back to where you were before or even worse. And now you go back to church again and you hear another amazing preacher. Not quite as good, but still pretty good. <laughs> and you feel really bad about what you've done. So you change your direction. You start living differently. But what happens? That shame, that guilt, it wears off. And you turn around and before you know it. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm getting at? Have, have you ever, do you know anybody? Because you've never done that. Not you or me. Them. No, <laughs> no, seriously, have you ever seen people like that? That they're at the altar almost every week for the exact same thing, repenting for the same thing over and over and over. Let me tell you something. Repentance is not when you cry. I'm glad that you cry. I'm glad that, that, that you feel God tugging at your heart. But what are you going to do with that tug? That's what I want to know. You see, the reason... The reason that you turn back around is the shamefulness of you can't sustain you. The only thing that can sustain you is the love of God. Look, can, can you help me out? Come up here real quick. Let me show you what this looks like in, in real life application. What's your name again, man? Elijah. Elijah. All right, Elijah. Here's the way this is going to work. I want to go this way. This way is bad for me, though. All right, this is sin. It's the world. It's going to lead to death. It's horrible. This is the way that all of God's promises are. This is following the Lord. This is all his goodness. I'm going to go this way, and I want you to tell me I'm making a horrible mistake. I'm wasting my life. I shouldn't do it. I should be ashamed. I should feel awful. All right? Elijah, here I come. Man. I'm going to go this way, buddy. That's the way I want to go. All right. Don't go that way. You're don't. Gonna, you're going to be in a bad situation. It's a bad it's bad mistake. It's horrible. Okay, Elijah. Thank you for doing that. I'll turn around. But you know what? It did feel pretty good, though. Nah, horrible, I think I... That's horrible, bad? It's horrible situation. All right. If it's bad, all right, you're right. It's bad for me. I'll go this way. But you know what? I did kind of think I want to. No? What I saw. Okay. All right. <laughs> This man is getting physical. We're going to stop the demonstration. No. All right. Now, this time, Elijah, let's do it again. Pay attention. But this time, don't tell me how bad that way is for me. This time, I want you to show me how good this side is instead. Tell me how this side, 
how God loves me, that there's a plan for my life, that he forgives me, that he's not mad at me, that he cares about me. You got it? All right. Elijah, I want to go this way. It looks really fun. Man, if you come this way, you're going to enjoy it a lot. This way's better? A lot better. God's good? God's good. He's got a plan? He's got a plan. Well, I'm going to go that way. I'm going to keep going. Yeah. All right. Give it up for Elijah. Thanks, man. Do you understand? Are you getting the picture? Do you see what I'm talking about? The shamefulness of you can't sustain you. Feeling bad doesn't sustain you. What sustains you? What keeps you going the right direction? You know, people write to me all the time. They're like, Kelly, I just keep struggling with my sin. I keep struggling. I feel so bad. I want to quit. What do I do? You need to get a revelation of who Jesus is and how good he is. And it has nothing to do with, with you feeling bad about it. It has everything to do with how good he is and how what he offers in love, nothing in the world even compares. But until you get close to him, you're never going to realize that. Amen. So let's recap real quick. What is repentance? It's a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. What is repentance? It's a change of mind. that leads to a change of Grace. it's a change of mind. that leads to a change of. Grace. All right. Do you feel like you got a good grip on repentance? Now, what causes repentance? What does Romans 2, 4 says? It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. What leads to repentance? The goodness of God. What leads to repentance? Goodness of God. What leads to repentance? Goodness of God. All right, you feel like you got a good grip on repentance now, on real repentance, what it looks like, what it means. You do? All right, because what I want to do for the short amount of time that we have left, I want to show you the greatest story of repentance ever told in the Bible. Can I do that? It was rhetorical. I'm going to anyway. This, this story is hands down the greatest story of repentance. And you will find it in John 4, 1 through 42, if you want to follow along. Now, some of you, you Bible scholars that really know your Bible, right now you're going, wait a minute. Hang on, Kelly. I know that story. That's the woman at the well. We've read your book. You said that was reckless love. Shameless plug of book one. Thank you. Look, and while I would like to say, yeah, the woman at the well is one of the most amazing stories of reckless love I've ever read in my life. The more I studied it and the more I read it, what I quickly learned is that while it is an amazing story of reckless love, it is the ultimate. See what I did there? Brought it back. It's the ultimate story of repentance in the Bible. Can I show you? Let me show you. Let's take a ride together. I'm not going to read the whole scripture because it's kind of long. I recommend you read it at home. The story is amazing. I'm just going to key in some highlighted verses here, all right? So the beginning of the story, in verse 1, it says, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John, so he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. That's the first verse I want you to see. It says he had to go through Samaria. You see, from Judea to Galilee, this is a trip that Jews took all the time. Now, right in the middle of Judea and Galilee was a little town called Samaria. Here's the thing, though. Jews hate Samaritans. Samaritans hate Jews. It's a total racial thing. The Jews thought that the Samaritans were half-breeds. They thought that they would have no part to play in the coming Messiah. They didn't want anything to do with them. So if you were a Jew going from Judea to Galilee or vice versa, the way that this works is you would take three extra days out of your trip and go around Samaria instead of going through it. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever hated somebody or something so much? You would go three days out of your way to avoid them? Dude, that's next level hate right? That, that statistic alone blows my mind. Y'all hated them so much. But what did it say about Jesus, though? He had to, did it say he accidentally went through? He just found himself walking through? There he was going through? Nah, he had to. I love that. He had to. Why did he have to? We know. It's not a trick question. God, he's going to meet the woman. Yeah. He's got a date. Not that kind of date. He's got a date. He's going to go meet this woman at the well. Now, let's, let's keep reading. It says, Jacob's there. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone to the village to buy some food. Now, let's pause right there for a second. 
Have you ever been reading the Bible and you come across something and you're like, why was that in there? Didn't need that. Like, like <laughs> Jesus got to the well at noon, okay? <laughs> you checked your eye watch. Great. <laughs> the fact that you're at the noon is at there is good enough for me, right? I don't need to know the time. Listen, let me tell you something. Every single word in the Bible can teach you something. Every word is in there on purpose. Every word is full of power. Amen. Amen. I love that it tells us he got there at noontime. Why? Why did it tell us he was there at noontime? Anybody know? What's the, what's the significance of it being noon? Hottest part of the day. Nobody goes to get water at noon. Nobody. But this lady is. See, the way it worked back then was at 6 in the morning, the first, first light of day, the women would get up and go get water for the day while it was cool. So they didn't have to carry those... Big jars while it's hot. Makes sense to me. But not this woman. The Bible makes note. It makes a point to tell us she was there at the heat of the day. Why? Why was she? Wanted to avoid other people. She was ashamed. She'd been ridiculed. People made fun of her. She felt marginalized. Didn't want to be around anybody. Ashamed of herself. Her own life. Wants to avoid people at all costs, so much so that she'll go in the middle of the day to get water for her family just to avoid people. But not today. Because Jesus is there. And she's going to run right face into this man. And I love it. Ready? So he asked her for a drink. Now watch this. The woman was surprised. For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? What's happening here? Let me show you. Her mind has always been made up in one direction. She's always gone one way. We hate Jews. They hate us. I want nothing to do with them. They want nothing to do with me. And now for a Jewish man to talk to a Jewish or a Samaritan woman, that, now that's double unheard of, right? Listen, you... You don't talk to a Jew if you're a Samaritan. If you're a Samaritan woman, you definitely don't talk to a Jewish man. And here Jesus is asking her for a drink. And she says, and I will quote the Bible, she goes, bruh. <laughs> Just see it if you're awake. You're like, look at your Bible. I don't see that. What? It's not in there. I just want you, are you getting, are you getting how crazy of a request this is? This is Jesus being a punk all day long. He knows what this is doing to the inside of her, right? Can I have a drink? Excuse me, bro. I know you're not. Let's put this into our terms. I know you're not talking to me right now, dude. I got no drink for you, right? Look, she's responding out of hate. She's responding out of the way her mind has. It's not her fault. She was raised that way. It's all she's ever known. We hate them. So that's how she's responding. Now watch this. I love it. How does Jesus reply? Jesus says, if you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. <laughs> Jesus mic drop. Boom. Right on her. Right. Now watch this. Watch this. What, what, what leads to repentance? The shamefulness of you? The goodness of God. Huh. It's, what leads to repentance? The goodness of God. Let's read what Jesus just said here again. If you only knew the gift God has for you. A gift sounds pretty good. Doesn't it to you? Watch this. Watch this. Let's keep going. But sir, she says, you don't have a rope or a bucket. And this well is like super deep. Where would you even get this living water from, huh? Watch, watch, she's still responding out of hate, right? Now watch, she's going to tip the scales here. And besides, bruh, <laughs> do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and animals enjoy? She is straight calling him out. Who do you think you are, man? You're going to come to my well and tell me I need what you've got? I don't think so, bro. My family dug this well. You better than us. 
Her mind has always been made up one direction. She's always gone one way. I love this. Jesus replies, you ready? Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Oh, son. Do you catch what Jesus just said there? What he just said was, I've got water that never runs out. Why was she there at noon? To avoid people. But why was she there at all? To get water. What did Jesus just offer her? Water that never runs out. What does that mean? She'll never have to go back to that well again. That sounds pretty <laughs> amazing. You're right. What leads to repentance? The goodness of God. What's happening here? Repentance. That's exactly what's happening. You see, here's the thing. Why is this, why is this important to us? Where's, where's the connection here for us? I'll, I'll tell you where the connection is for us here. Is Jesus really offering her water that never runs out? No. What's he really talking about? himself. What he's saying is, you can keep coming to this well and avoiding people, trying to find what you need, but it's going to keep leaving you empty over and over and over. Or you can come to me, give your life to me, and I will fill you so full that you will never run dry again. What does that mean for me and you? I'll tell you what it means for me and you. You see, every single day, every single one of us in this room, when you wake up, you run to a well. There is a well that you run to that you look for fulfillment. You look for something to fill you up. It may be your job, maybe work, maybe status, maybe people, maybe fame, maybe a relationship, maybe shopping, maybe your kids, maybe school. I don't know. It may be a drug. It may be alcohol. It may be video games. It may be pornography. I don't know what it is, but I do know this. Whatever it is that you're running to, to find your fulfillment and your purpose, if it's not Jesus, it will leave you empty time and time again. And you're going to have to keep switching and finding something else and trying something new because everything you try will leave you just as empty as the last thing. However, if you will get up every day and run to the well that is Jesus, he will speak so much life into you. He will speak so much purpose into you. He will fulfill you completely, so full that you will never have to look anywhere else to find your fulfillment again. Amen? And it has nothing to do with the shamefulness of you. And it has everything to do with the goodness of him. Amen? This is for every single one of us in this room today. I don't care if you've been a Christian three minutes or 30 years. This is for you. Now watch what happens. She tell, he tells her about this water that never runs out. And I love her response now. Watch this. Ready? Please, sir. The woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here to get water. Hmm. Something changed. You know what I like to call that? Repentance. Look, look, her mind has always been made up one direction. This is what I believe about Jews. This is what I believe about me. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want what you've got. Now she hears about something that is so good. Now what does she do? She changes her mind and she changes her direction. By definition, that is repentance. Please, sir, that gift sounds amazing. I want that. I want what you've got, Jesus. And I love this. Watch this. You ready? Here's Jesus' response. Go get your husband. Oh, savage Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's cold, man. Oh. Because <laughs> we know. We already know. The reason she's so ashamed 
is because she's had five husbands. And the guy she's living with now isn't her husband. And Jesus goes, go get your husband. <laughs> so cold, man. And I love it. She goes, I don't have a husband. Jesus is like, you ain't lying. <laughs> he goes, you're right, girl. You don't have a husband. Matter of fact, you've had five. And the guy you're living with now ain't even your husband. Please, please pay attention to what just happened here. This is vital. This is very important. Don't miss this. Was it the devil that just brought up the most shameful moments of her life? Who was it? Jesus. It wasn't the devil that reminded her how horrible she was. It was Jesus. However, my Bible says, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, I love it. He puts his thumb right on the most shameful, most hurtful area of her life. But not to judge her. To love her instead. And I love this. See, here's what I want you to understand. For some of you tonight, you're going to repent. It's going to be a major repentance. That I like, like you've needed to for a long time. So you, you already know it right now. You, you cannot wait for me to get to the prayer. Somebody in this room right now. Because you are ready for it. But here's what's going to happen. As soon as we see the goodness of God... And we want to change our mind and change our direction. Let me show you something. The very next thing that's going to happen is you're going to realize the unworthiness of you. But what I want you to see was it wasn't the devil that showed her the unworthiness. It was Jesus. Because the truth is we, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve that love. We don't deserve that grace. We're a mess. But here's what I want you to see. Jesus wants you to see it so that you can understand. I can trust you with all of me. You're not judging me for any of it. Yes, you're going to bring it up. Yes, you need to expose it. But that's so I can get free from it. The devil wants you to keep things hidden with shame and guilt. Because if you will keep it buried deep inside, you will never be free from it. He knows if you will just confess it, if you will just let Jesus have access to it, you'll get free. So Jesus shows her, yeah, you're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the guy you're living with now, not even your husband. But he doesn't judge her, he doesn't condemn her. Now watch, this is so good. Here's what she says. <laughs> she changes the subject. Jesus calls her out on the most shameful area of her life. Yeah, girl, you don't have a husband. Matter of fact, you have five. That guy you live with now, not even your husband. What says you, girl? And she completely changes the subject and goes on eight verses talking about where we're going to worship God. Now, I was really happy when I read that in the Bible because I've got a wife. And I have two daughters in their 20s and one two-year-old daughter. And I'm not going to tell you that I'm right a lot in my house, okay? I'll be very honest. <laughs> but every once in a while, I catch one of those girls slipping. And I'm right and they're wrong. And I call them on it. And do you know what they do as soon as I call them on it? They change the subject every single time. And I read the Bible and I'm like, okay, God, they've been doing this for 2,000 years. It's not me. It's them. It's... I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> no. somebody's sleeping on a couch tonight I'm sorry bro <laughs> that was the wrong time to preach it no. I'm joking that's not what's happening here can I show you what's really happening here you see back in these times for a Jew to talk to a Samaritan that's heard of, and unheard of for a Samaritan woman to talk to a Jewish man that is completely unheard of but there's one more thing that women were not allowed to even discuss with anybody but their husbands back then. And do you know what that was? Worship. You see, what's really happening here is Jesus calls out the worst of her, puts his thumb right on it, but doesn't judge her, doesn't make her feel bad, just loves her through it. And I guarantee you, she felt such a peace, such a fulfillment, such a joy. She said, you know what? If we're going to do this thing, we're going to go all the way. I'm not supposed to talk about worship, but I'm going to talk to you about that too. 
And she just starts going. And she starts talking, where will we worship? In Jerusalem? Will we worship here? And then after eight verses, she gets caught up and she realizes what's happening. And she stops and she goes, you know what? You know what? Never mind. Eventually, the Messiah will come. And he will make this all clear for us. Watch this. And then Jesus utters some of the most amazing words in the history of the world. The most amazing words that have never been spoken until this moment. He looks at her and he says, I am the Messiah. <laughs> Do you see what's happening here? How many of you have ever felt like God can't use you? My hand's up. I mean, you've ever felt I'm too far gone. I've messed up too much. God can't have a purpose for me anymore. Look at my life. It's a mess. You ever felt like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is this woman. And you know what? I used to preach that maybe she was kind of a half-breed whore, I've said in a book before. And I made, I put all of this on her. Like she left these men. Like, like she was a promiscuous woman. That's how I originally taught the story. And then I learned a thing or two. And I found out that back in this time period, if you were a woman, you couldn't divorce a man. A man had to divorce you. So what does that really mean? That means this woman has been thrown away five times. She's been rejected by people that were supposed to love her time and time again. She puts her trust in people. They let her down. They throw her away. This woman felt like she had nothing for nobody. Nothing. Nothing to offer. A Samaritan. A half-breed who the Jews believed would have no part of the coming Messiah. Jesus goes to this woman and says, you came at, you came at noon because you didn't want to be around anybody. I'm about to make you the most famous woman in the history of the world. You think you don't have a purpose. People will talk about you for all of eternity. Because of what I'm about to say to you right now, I am the Messiah. I pick you to say that too. Let me tell you, somebody sitting in this room, you feel like you have no plan. There's no call for you. There is no purpose. You don't know what to do. Let me tell you something. God has a plan for you that's so much bigger than anything you ever could have imagined. You are not too far gone. And right here in this story is where we get the most beautiful, the most perfect scripture that shows us a picture of what repentance looks like that I've ever seen in my life. Are you ready? Buckle your seatbelts. Verse 28 says this. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone. Seriously. Oh, only three of you got it. Did you not hear what I said? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone. If you don't know what repentance looks like, it looks like that. Oh, you still don't get it? Why did she come to the well that day? What did she leave at the well that day? Why did she come at noon? Where did she go when she left? <laughs> Repentance. When you have an encounter with Jesus and you see the goodness of God, it should change your mind and it should change your direction. She came that morning to get water. She left the water at the well. She came avoiding people. She left the first evangelist in the history of the world. That's what repentance looks like. Watch this. And it had nothing to do with how bad she felt about herself. It had everything to do with how good Jesus was to her. And what it looks like when you give Jesus access to the worst of you. Oh, is that so good? That's so good, isn't it? Now, let me, let me explain something to you, okay? Maybe some of you don't know. If you don't know my, my history, my testimony. Before I was a preacher, I used to work in the music industry. And yeah, I didn't ever make it as a rock star myself, but I did. I used to be a tour manager for some of the biggest rock bands in the world. In the early 2000s, I was out with Nickelback, Three Days Grace, Breaking Benjamin, See that you, you name a big rock band, I was probably with them. That's what I did. And we, uh, our management company also owned a record label. Now, I love writing songs, but my favorite part about writing songs is picking a title. Because if you get a good title, people are going to click on your song. 
Now, whether the song is good or not, that's up to you. But you get a good title, at least they'll click on it, right? Now, listen, when I switched to preaching, nothing changed. I love writing sermon titles because I want you to click on it on YouTube, right? So when I got to this sermon, and I'm like, all right, God, this is a sweet sermon. I, man, I need a good title for this. What am I going to call it? God kept taking me back to this verse. And I kept reading, the woman left her jar beside the well, beside the well. And then I just started seeing the word beside, beside, beside. But then it switched from beside to B-side, but not B-E-S-I-D-E. I started to see it as B-S-I-D-E. B-side. Does anybody in here know what this is? What is that? That's a cassette. Kids, this is music. Music used to be a tangible thing. You could touch it. There ain't no playlist on here. Are you kidding me, man? Listen, you want to know how I pick my favorite song? I couldn't just go to a playlist, play, mm, jamming. Nuh-uh, that's not how it worked for me. I have to put this bad boy in, push play. Nope, fast forward, fast forward. Nope, fast forward, fast forward. Nope, fast forward. Oh, rewind, rewind. There it is, right? <laughs> That's how we listen to music, kids. But here's what you, you may remember. Cassettes have an A side and a B side. Yeah, you're getting it. You, you start, you're following along. Okay. Now, just to make this clear, you already can tell I love definitions. Let me read you the definition of B side. Because God told me to name this sermon, Flip to the B side. Here's the definition. The B-side is a secondary recording that has a history of its own. Some artists released B-sides that were considered stronger than the A-side and became hits in their own right. Now, let me explain how this works, coming from somebody that was in the music industry. When we would manage a band, the band would be writing a new record. They would write the songs, they would send them to us. We would listen to them. We would hear a song and go, okay, that's a hit, A-side. That's a hit, A-side. Ah, that song's okay, B-side. Eh, that song, that's a filler, B-side. Oh, that's a hit, A-side. We would listen to all the music, and then we would make a plan for that band's career of which songs we thought were going to be hits on the radio and which songs we like to call filler. We'd put them on the B-side. But what this definition said is every once in a while, the plan that the labels and the management and the A&R guys come up with isn't actually the one that's successful. It's the B-side instead. You see, can anybody see what band this is? I know. ACDC. Did anybody like ACDC in here? All right, pastor, there's the sinners. Get them. You're welcome. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I used to listen to ACDC all the time. Love them. All right. But I picked this record on purpose because this album probably changed this band's life forever. This album right here, Back in Black, is one of the greatest selling rock and roll albums of all time. Out of all bands, this is just one of the top records. Matter of fact, three of this band's biggest hits they've ever had are on this album. They are tracks two, five, and six of the B-side. Do you see what I'm saying? A whole team of people got together listened to all of these songs, and made a plan for what they thought was going to be successful for their life, and they put them on the A side. Then they released this album, and the world got a hold of it, and it was the B side. The B side that changed everything. You see, our story said she left her jar at the B side. See, here's what I want you to understand. Every one of us run to a well every day. But Jesus is at that well every day. And if you will have an encounter with Jesus and you will let him flip you to the B side. You see, when you come to the well, you're coming on your A side. This is your plan for your life. This is what you thought would work for you. This is the way. These are my decisions. This is what I've chose. This is my plan. This is who I want to be. This is where I want to work. This is what I want to do. This is my plan for my life. And then you get to Jesus and you have a choice to make. Or you can say, I can keep going on side A, my plan for my life. Or I can put this cassette in your hand. And I can trust you to flip it over to the B side and see if maybe, just maybe, there are hits that I had no idea were coming. You see, if you will just let Jesus flip you to the B side, 
you're going to see that your plan, yeah, it was pretty good. His is incredible. His is amazing. When you follow his purpose and his plan, then he works all things together for your good. You go through something rough, doesn't matter. He's working it for good. Why? Because it's his purpose, not your plan. You're on the B side. Amen? And is that good? Is that blessing you? That's a good story of repentance, isn't it? All right, and then I will, uh, I will conclude with this. And I love to use the word conclude because I read in a book somewhere one time that when you say the word conclude, 70% of your audience re-engages with you. Welcome back. I'm still here. I will conclude with this. And band, if you guys want to come back, you're welcome to. Do you remember the first verse that I read to you in this story? Talking about Jesus going through Samaria. He what? He had to. He had to, didn't he? For Jesus to flip her over to the B side, to show her that her life was worth way more than she thought. He had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. You ever thought about that? He had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. He had to go through Samaria. He has to go through some area in you that you've been avoiding. When we started this story, we said it's ridiculous that those Jews would take three days to go out of their way. We all agree that's ridiculous. We would never do that. But the truth is, some of you in this room, have been avoiding some area for way more than three days. Some of you have been avoiding some area in your life for 30 years, for six months, for I don't know how long. But you know right now in this moment, you feel it in the pit of your stomach right now, there is an area in your life that you haven't given Jesus access to yet because you feel ashamed. You feel dirty, perhaps. You feel like Jesus can't love me through this because I don't even love myself through this. If that's you today, what I want to tell you is Jesus had to go through Samaria and he has to go through that area in you. Not to make you feel ashamed, not to beat you up, not to condemn you, but to show you how good he can be in that area of your life, too. That area that you don't even want to look at, that you keep closed off. He said, if you'll just allow me access to go through this, I have a B-side for you that will blow your mind. That it's so much better than anything you thought you had for yourself. Amen? Amen. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to pray for us tonight. Some of us need to repent tonight. If you want to get real honest, every single one of us needs to repent tonight. Because what is repentance? It's a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. I was preaching at a church one time, and I was talking about repentance. It wasn't this message. It was another one. But I had a lady come up to me after the service, and she said, Kelly, I repented like 20 years ago. I'm good. I was like, oh. I said, I repented 20 times the last 10 minutes. Listen, repentance is not a one-time thing. If you're sitting here today and you say, you know what, I've already repented. I've given my life to Jesus. That's awesome. That's repentance for salvation. There's also repentance for restoration. Meaning the first time you give your life to Jesus, yes, that's repentance. It got you saved. But when you got saved, did that remove all sin from your life? Not at all. You still make mistakes. And my Bible tells us it's sin that separates us from the Father. What puts us back in right standing with the Father? repentance. See, repentance is a gift. It's not a heavy thing. It's not a bad thing. We repent anytime we realize my mind doesn't match up with Jesus's mind. I don't care what it is on whatever issue. As soon as you realize I'm not following Jesus in this, I don't care what it is. As soon as you realize that's when you repent. I'm telling you, I repent a million times a day, especially when I'm driving in my car right? Come on. 
It's not a one-time thing. We repent. It's a gift because it gets us close to God. So I want to ask a question tonight. Who needs to repent? Yeah. You don't have to put your hand up yet. I'm gonna have, you can bow your head, close your eyes. You can, you can play. Cool, man. We, we know the Holy Spirit doesn't move if there's no music, so That's come on. Right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Holy Spirit is here. Absolutely. I want to pray for you. Bow your head, close your eyes. I'm done, I promise. But before I pray, I want you to think for a minute about today. I want you to think about last week, last month, last year. Is there an area in your life that you've been avoiding? Some of you, you know instantly right now, God has already showed you. You know exactly what it is. Is there an area that you've been avoiding? Is there something that you've been ashamed of? Is there a hurt that you've been carrying around for 30, 40 years? Maybe somebody that was supposed to love you, protect you, and care for you, a parent, a relative, maybe they spoke something over you that you've been carrying around for 40 years. Maybe they did something to you that was awful, that you didn't deserve, that you've been carrying around for 40 years. Let me tell you something. The shame and the guilt that you feel for that area didn't come from God. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Yes, he wants you to feel that area right now. Yes, he's bringing it up on purpose. It's not the devil. It's not to make you feel ashamed, though, or guilty. He's bringing it up because he's saying, please let me have access to this area today because I want to love you through it. I want to show you that I'm not mad at you. You don't have to carry this guilt or shame. I want to trade you for peace tonight and joy and love. Stop avoiding this area. Give me access because I love you. If that's you today and you know that's you, I want you to stand up right here in front of everybody. Yeah, amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Who else? That's not it. That's not all. Who else? I told you, come expecting today. Come expecting. And here's what I want you to expect, that when you leave those doors, you walk out lighter than you came because you're not carrying guilt anymore. You're not carrying shame anymore. Those things are heavy. But what Jesus gives you is light. And it refreshes you. Who else? There's somebody else. There's somebody else. And you don't want to stand up because to everybody else, you're the good Christian. To everybody else, you're the one that never makes a mistake, but you know the truth. But here's what you don't know. When you stand up and you let those people see that you're not perfect either, they're going to get set free too. The devil wants you to stay sitting down because he doesn't want you free and he doesn't want them free. But I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit's not letting me move. I'm trying to move, man. I want to I wanna sit down. I promise you I do. The Holy Spirit won't let me yet. Don't miss an opportunity. This is not about guilt. It's not about shame. It's about freedom. It's about peace. It's about joy. Repentance is what gets us close to the Father. It's a gift. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing up. Yeah. I want everybody to look around the room. Look around at who's standing up. Yeah. See, I want you to look around because one of the biggest weapons and tactics of the devil is to tell you, don't tell anybody. Don't let Jesus have access to this. Don't talk about this. You're the only one struggling with it. You're the only one. It's just you. Well, look around. I hope you realize that's a lie. We're all in the same boat. Understand, you don't have to struggle alone. You're not gonna stop sinning because you repent tonight. But what I want you to see is that you've got brothers and sisters that you can lean on, that you can rely on, that you can call when you're hurting. And they can remind you the truth. Jesus paid for you. He's good. Amen. So I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for every single person in this room that made a choice to stand up and say, Father, I give you access to all of me. We give you access to every area today. Whatever it is that they've been avoiding, Father, we give you access. We welcome you today. Not to judge us 
but to love us through it. God, we thank you that your repentance brings us closer to you. God, I thank you for every single person that carried in shame, guilt, stress, anxiety. Right now, they're dropping it at your throne. And I thank you that you're filling them with peace, love, joy, because that's who you are. God, I thank you that we leave here tonight with a fresh understanding of what repentance really means. And that the the sign of a mature believer is how fast we run to the cross when we realize we missed it. God, I thank you that this is a church and a body that embraces repentance as the gift that it is. And if you're here tonight in this room and you realize, you know what? I've never given my life to Jesus. I need him to go through all of me. I've never let him walk through any area. I'm so far from God. Maybe you have given your life to Jesus, but you realize right now you are so far away. You repented once and you thought you were good, but you realize tonight I need to rededicate my life to him. Listen, if you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or the five millionth time, let's do it right now. Listen, I don't know that tomorrow is going to be here. I can't promise you it will. But I do know this. I want to give you a high five in heaven. I want to give you a hug in heaven. I don't want to be there without you. If you want to know for sure that's where you're going to spend eternity, let me tell you how the Bible says to do it. There's no magical prayer that gets saved. It doesn't exist. The Bible says you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and died for you. But he didn't stay dead. He rose three days later and made a bridge for us to get to his Father. And I know, I know you're going to believe that. I know you believe that. You've been sitting right here tonight. It says you believe that in your heart, and then it says you confess with your mouth. Listen, that's what the prayer does. It helps you confess with your mouth that he is Lord of your life. And there's one more step. It says repent of your sins. And I think you know exactly what that means. It means change your mind. Change your direction. You follow Jesus now, not the world. Amen. So that's you tonight. You want to give your life to Jesus for the first time or you want to rededicate it? Put your hand up so we can help you confess with you. Yeah, I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Put your hands together for them. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Amen. Ah, this is the reason I come. Preaching's fun, but introducing people to Jesus is my favorite thing. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? I don't want to miss you. I don't want to miss you. I see you guys. Amen. We're all going to pray together as a family with you. Repeat out loud with me, please. Say, Jesus, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Tonight, I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my past. Make me brand new. You are the Lord of my life. You can go through every area. Bruh. <laughs> In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Hey, this is Pastor and Evangelist Kelly Kay, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching this video today. I pray that it blessed you and encouraged you. If you would like to go deeper in your walk with the Lord, I also have a 40-day devotional out just to help you get in the practice of spending time in God's Word every single day. What we do is we take a scripture, we break it down, we apply it to our life, there's a prayer for the day, and then space for you to write down what God is speaking to you. Look, this is an excellent tool and resource to come alongside your Bible reading. It shouldn't take place of it. This book has blessed so many people. I know it'll bless you as well. You can get it today at kellykministries.com or you can get it on Amazon if you want free shipping. Either way, check it out today. Also, if you want to sow into this ministry, if you've been blessed by this ministry, you can do that as well by going to kellykministries.com and there's a place right on the front page where you can sow into this ministry. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. We are praying for you and believing that God is doing mighty things in your life every single day. So we'll see you next time and go out and watch what Jesus can do through you.